Good morning, CBC. Let's stand and let's worship Jesus for the victory that we have in him.
Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning. Hey, I'm very excited. Uh, we have a service today where uh, we get to look back on about a decade of faithful provision for our church. Um, and I was just thinking, I want to share this thought with you. How wise is it to look back before we look forward? Um, our God's faithfulness to us as an individual, God's faithfulness to us as the people of God, which you can read uh, all throughout the Bible, should inform our faith going forward. So I hope you guys will join us uh, in looking back at a decade of faithful service um, for Pastor Matt and his family, um, and that if you are have been with us for the last 10 years, you'll get to enjoy looking back at the full view. Uh, but if you're like me and you've been here a few years, or this is your first Sunday, uh, that you'll enjoy looking back at God's faithful provision uh, to this church. Um, if you are new today, uh, I'd like you to just take a quick moment. Hopefully you saw a connection card in the seat when you sat down uh, that has a QR code on it. You can fill it out manually as well and drop it off at the info desk. Uh, but that'll help us get you plugged into some resources, whether it's prayer or questions you want answered, uh, and also a cool free gift. So um, that is all I have for the new people. If you guys would please um, join me as we focus our hearts and mind, uh, we'll read an invitation to worship together. And I'll be reading this, um, but feel free to hear it and receive it. To all who are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who fail and desire strength, to all who sin and need a savior, to all who do not yet believe and long for love. This church opens wide her doors with a welcome from Jesus, the mighty friend of sinners. picture guy, our church, our community, and each of us have individually benefited from his abilities. His vision has brought us, uh, brought about <clears throat> this building that we're sitting in, various ministries to our community, foreign missions, but his vision for a culture of grace is what is, in my view, the most important change that affects our lives. We've all watched as Matt has become very skilled in his preaching. He has his own unique uh, ability to present each message to show God's love and grace in a way which we can understand and apply to our own lives. Matt's preaching is captivating. It's at times passionate. It's easy to follow. It's often challenging, and it's always encouraging. Matt is a gifted minister of the word. But more than a preacher, Matt is a pastor. There's a difference to be sure. What I appreciate about Matt is his attention to detail. I don't mean how organized he is, and he is that. <clears throat> I mean the details that pertain to people's lives. One of our, <clears throat> our first encounters I had with Matt was when we had a dear friend who went through a, a tragedy, and he had to come alongside them. I observed as he showed compassion for their situation, he felt for what they were going through, and he sought to comfort them. Showing compassion is what a true pastor does. It's what our Savior did as he walked this earth. I've experienced Matt's care in my own life. He's reached out to me on more than one occasion when he knew of a circumstance I was going through. <clears throat> he encouraged me when I was carrying a lot of weight during the construction of this building. He offered once to defend me in a particular situation in that process. Defending and encouraging the sheep is what a true pastor does. It's what Jesus did and what he continues to do today. It's in the little things he does. A small but important example is every week he points to find the scripture passage for those who may not be as familiar with the Bible. But he's careful to do it in a way that's not demeaning but encouraging. 
making sure everyone feels welcome, making sure they feel welcome to the gospel message is what a true pastor does. It's what our Lord did. Matt made a promise early that he would always take time to share the gospel with those who are still in need of knowing the love and forgiveness of the cross. As best I can tell, he's kept that promise week in and week out. Bringing life-giving words is what a true pastor does. It's what Jesus exhausted himself doing. <clears throat> Over the years, I've expressed many encouraging words and offered my wisdom to Matt. I let him, how thank, let him know how thankful I was for the messages that Erica made up for him for presenting every Sunday. <laughs> I let him know sometimes when his messages were too loud that kept many of us awake during the sermon time. And I let him know how, how fortunate he was that he gets the job where he only has to work one day a week. Yeah. And, and many other encouraging like statements. Um, the reason I can do that is because Matt is a friend. <clears throat> a pastor, a true pastor, is not a figurehead. A true pastor is a friend. Jesus, too, is our friend. Matt, I want to congratulate you on 10 years of faithful service to our church. Thank you for doing that. We look forward to many more years to come. Thank you. Well, it is, can you hear me? It is certainly apparent that God has richly blessed us all here at C1C. For not, God not only gave us our beloved Pastor Matt, but he included Erica in the deal. Amen. Now we know that being a pastor's wife is incredibly difficult, for she does walk through the mountains with him, but she is also beside him as he goes through the deep valleys. And we know that when darts are thrown at Matt, that Erica bleeds as well. So, when I think of the gift that you are to us, friend, I concluded that you played quite an important part in these past 10 years here by not only faithfully supporting Matt, by being such a beautiful example of the love of Jesus to all around you. Your smile alone makes our day. But there is something far deeper in you than just your beauty. It's a deeper beauty. You have a deep, deep love for the Holy Scriptures. You have a deep love for your husband and for your precious children. And you excel in your role as wife and as mother. You excel at encouraging the faint-hearted. Erica, you are kind, you are humble, and you are hospitable. You, through God's grace, have been a warrior, not only because you are a precious survivor of cancer, but a survivor of all the other trials through your life. So, it gives us all great joy to pay tribute to you two today, because you are definitely worthy of high honor, and we are so thankful for you. We, we have a gift uh, from our body for each of you. Um, one of the gifts that we have is our, our entire body wrote letters to, to both of you because, again, we love you and we thank God for you. So, love you, Owens.
is the Joseph juggle that we don't quite have down yet. <laughs> Would you stand against, again with me as we continue to worship? And I'm going to read um, from Hebrews 2. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source, that is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted.
We also pray for Pastor Joseph and his family as they experience a sabbatical. May it be a time of great refreshment, deepening relationships, and a closer walk with you. We pray for our friends at City Church this morning who have the privilege of baptizing more than 45 people, 45 people who are going public with their faith in Jesus. We celebrate with you. Lord, we pray that if there are people here who are not yet believed, that this be the day when they turn from their sin and turn to Jesus in faith. Now prepare our hearts and minds as Pastor Matt comes to teach us your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning. Nice to see all of you and worship with you this morning. We're going to be in Galatians chapter 1 today. It's going to take us a couple minutes to get there, but if you want to start and get a, get a head start going there, Galatians chapter 1 is where we're going to be. And if you don't have a Bible with you, there are Bibles in uh, the chair racks there in front of you. You can hunt one of those down and find it. And Galatians chapter 1 is going to be on page 972 of the Bibles that are there in the chair racks in front of you. Uh, before I get started, I'll just uh, give you some unprepared remarks of thanks. <laughs> um, that feels very awkward, so thank you for putting me on the spot like that. Um, very awkward. I, I've been thinking a little bit about uh, 10 years of ministry here and thinking about um, how to really direct the glory to Christ in all of that. Um, it's interesting when you, uh, when you begin something like that, um, you know you have to depend on God, uh, but you also, if you're young enough, uh, feel fairly able to the task <laughs> until you start doing the task. And then you realize, oh, I actually cannot do this. And um, I've thought... Uh, many times uh, I cannot do this uh, through the years, and then there have been circumstances uh, that have brought, uh, been brought into uh, ministry that have made me realize that that was actually true. I cannot do this, and I think it takes time to get to a place where you have to realize that you cannot actually do this. <laughs> you are not, in fact, up to the task, no matter how much preparation you can, you've done and you are going to need a lot of God's grace. And he's given a lot of that grace to us. Uh, it's an interesting thing. Uh, God asks uh, broken people uh, to lead broken people, which is a recipe for disaster. <laughs> um, and so... The relationship that pastors ought to have with their churches are, it's a two-way street. Um, oftentimes, I think uh, pastoral ministry is intentionally, but often unwittingly, supposed to be from a place of strength. Uh, I'll show you the way. Uh, I'll teach you. Do it like I'm doing it, and you'll be successful. <laughs> um, but that's not actually what it is. Um, God calls pastors to have a measure of spiritual maturity, um, but the leadership that we're supposed to exhibit uh, is, is from a place oftentimes of weakness. And um, we need the congregation to give us as much grace <laughs> as the congregation needs grace from us. And uh, most of you haven't been here from the very beginning. Uh, to those of you who have been here from the very beginning, uh, thank you for being gracious with me and letting me learn. Uh, I had been an associate pastor, uh, but there's nothing that quite compares you. One of the great things about being an associate pastor, and I hope to get back there someday. <laughs> One of my favorite things about it is that there is a, there's the buck can always be passed. And so even if it's your mistake, you can be like, and just do that. Um, and that's one of the great things about it, that I, there's nobody else for me to turn and pass the buck to. Um, and I, I enjoyed that. The other thing uh, is just uh, getting used to preaching every week. <laughs> and uh, the only way to get better at it is to do it. And the only way to do it 
is to have a congregation that says, okay, we'll let you try. <laughs> uh, so thank you for that. And then the, the third thing is that, uh, and, and perhaps the most difficult thing is, uh, along the way, one of the most difficult things that you encounter is not uh, your own lack of skill, your uh, peop difficult people that you might have to shepherd. Uh, one of the most difficult things that you encounter is actually inside of you and is actually brought out in ministry. Uh, the most difficult thing about pastoring is the encounter with the darkness of your own heart. And uh, one of the things that has, has happened to me in the last 10 years is that God has used uh, being a pastor to absolutely crush me. And I mean that in the best way. And I do not want to do it again. Uh, but, but that is what has to happen. Uh, there's no way around that. You have to get crushed. And only when that happens can real things start happening. And um, so I'm thankful for all of the experiences and people <laughs> and my own heart that God has used to, to break. And as I, I stand up here, um, it would be easy to, it would be easy to uh, use a 10-year opportunity to run a little victory lap. Um, and I'm thankful for the victories, and there have been them. Um, I mean, look, most of you don't understand where we were. <laughs> uh, but what you're, what you're experiencing right now is it's quite shocking, actually. <laughs> um, not to God, but humanly speaking, it's, it's pretty shocking. Uh, but rather than running a victory lap, uh, I, I need to thank you for allowing me to do this putting up with mistakes, sitting through pretty lengthy sermons, uh, especially at the beginning. Man, I preached some long ones <laughs> that we're hoping to find a place to land. Uh, I want to thank you for being gracious to me, and I want to thank uh, my wife. Um, I've, I've quit many times, and she's talked me out of it many times. <laughs> Um, and I couldn't actually, I could not have gotten this far without her and my family, uh, who have been very gracious in riding the up and downs with me. So the verse that came to mind uh, this, this, uh, this morning was from Romans chapter 11, which talks about how inscrutable, <laughs> unsearchable are the ways of Christ, which is basically the Bible's way of saying, who knows what he's doing? I don't know how he did it, but he did. And then it says at the end of the chapter, for from him and to him and through him are all things. So to him be glory forever. Amen. And that's really where we want things to land. So there are your, uh, there are, there are your, my unprepared remarks and my thanks to you. And uh, my hope is to have ten more uh, by God's grace. All right. Let's go to Galatians. Galatians chapter 1. Uh, you should be there already if you want to be there. But today we're going to be uh, beginning a series called The Last Ten. Uh, the Last Ten, you can see it there on the graphic behind me. And what I thought would be really cool to do uh, before I knew or I had at least an inkling of, of what was going to happen today or that it would land on today, what I wanted to do was uh, choose one sermon from the past uh, ten years of books that we've been preaching through and re-preach it to you. And so for the vast majority of you, I'm not going to be re-preaching these things to you. This will be the first time that you ever heard, have ever heard them because most of you haven't been here for the whole ride. But some of you, by God's sheer sovereign grace, have made it uh, through 10 years uh, with me. And so you were there for the beginning of uh, our series, the very first series that I preached here at our church through the book of Galatians. Uh, our church didn't even have the same name back then when I preached through the book of, the, of Galatians, but the name of that series was Just Jesus. And I actually put the, uh, the graphic from that series up uh, just so that you could see it. And uh, I was wondering as I was gonna go, going back and I was going through the last decade of books that we've been through and trying to think, okay, what, what 
could I share from each of these? What's been most impactful for me? What might have been most impactful for them? And I was frankly wondering what I was going to encounter because I don't even like the sermons I preached three months ago. So to go back 10 years ago and find out what 10 years ago Matt was preaching, you kind of like look at it like, what, what did I say? <laughs> and the truth of the matter is, uh, a lot. Uh, I looked at my word count from 10 years ago, and my word count now is less than half of my word count in those sermons. So I thought I was going to be able to pick a sermon and just kind of run with it, and then I realized, okay, I've got to slice these things in half and still have them make some sense. And so it's turned out to be a lot more work than I anticipated. However, there is something that was really encouraging to me as I was looking at the series in Galatians. Because I named the series Just Jesus, and as I thought back of what I would want my ministry in the pulpit to be for my lifetime, it's that. That's that's what I wanted to start with, and I think that's what we're still on. And I was actually delighted to see that the kind, you know, uh, Kemp mentioned this, uh, a culture of grace. Um, A lot of times, I've mentioned this before, but a lot of times when people come here, there's this thing that they're like, there's this thing about you guys, and some of it's weird, uh, but some of it's also good, and uh, and it's culture. It is a, a culture of grace, and it's a culture that we haven't always experienced everywhere that we've been. And so I was very encouraged to see Um, that our church website still on the front page says that we are a community of believers centered on the gospel. We want to make Jesus the hero of everything that we're doing here, the center of everything we're doing here. And I have gotten several things wrong over the last 10 years. But I think this is one thing that we've gotten right. And my prayer is that for the next decade and then the next decade and the next decade, decade, long after some of us are dead and gone, that's still what's happening in our church. I I still hope 50, 100 years from now that our church is still about just Jesus. So we're going to read the first 10 verses of Galatians together to kind of load it into our minds, and then we're going to talk a little bit about it together. Actually, not the first 10, we're going to start in verse 3. So if you're there in Galatians chapter 1, let's begin reading the Bible in verse 3. The Word of God says this, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of God our Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you and the grace of Christ, and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you, a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Those are pretty strong words, aren't they? If anyone, and, and the Apostle Paul who wrote this as a letter to the Galatian church, the Apostle Paul is saying, if anyone preaches to you, if, if, if I or an angel from heaven preaches to you a different gospel from the one that's already been delivered to you, let them be cursed. These verses are obviously talking about the importance of holding fast to the true gospel. And in those verses that we read, the Apostle Paul gives us a short definition of the gospel. This is not everything that could be said about the gospel, but it certainly captures many of the points. You can see it again if you're, if you're there in verses 4 and 5. He's, he's talking about 
God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. The gospel is the good news that the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, have worked in concert together to rescue fallen, broken, and sinful humanity from their sin. They have all, the triune God decided before the earth was even founded that they were going to accomplish the redemption of a people to the glory of God's name. The Son was sent to become human, fully human and fully, fully God to accomplish this redemption. And the amazing thing, or one of the amazing things about the gospel, is how Jesus does this. Because Jesus does not just come to earth to be a sage. He does not come to the earth as a philosopher. He does not come to the earth as a wise, simply as a wise teacher, though he is all of those things. Furthermore, Jesus does not just come to show us the way, to, to show us the things that we ought to do, to model the things for us we ought to do, and then to tell us, now go and do likewise, though he also does that as well. The primary way that Jesus comes to deliver us is to, in the words of our text, give himself or offer himself. And that is a understated way of saying that Jesus comes to die. He takes on human flesh so that human flesh can be put to death. And he does that on behalf of sinners. He does it as a substitute standing in our place. He gives himself for our sins. He offers himself on the cross. He sees his very lifeblood drain out for your sins and for mine. And that work that he accomplishes on the cross is, is characterized by one of his final words on the cross when he says, it is finished. That work, the work of the redemption of, of fallen, sinful, broken humanity, the, 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 the pact or the covenant that the triune God had made before they decided to create anything was completed in that moment. Jesus accomplished everything that was needed for the redemption of lost humanity. He gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age. This present evil age, everything that's going on in us and around us and on the world stage, all of creation and all of humanity that is, that is in rebellion against God, God sent the Son, gave himself for us to deliver us from this. And the point that the Apostle Paul, the point that the Word of God is making this morning is, is that the gospel is entirely the work of God for the glory of God. I'll say that again. The gospel is entirely the work of God for the glory of God because we receive this gospel by faith. And faith, the Bible tells us, is not a work. Faith, has been put before, is simply this, an open hand that receives what God has done. So no wonder that the gospel is entirely the work of God for the glory of God, and so it is to, to the triune God belongs the glory forever and ever. Amen. That is the good news of the gospel. And so as we do each week, I'll stop right here and say, did you hear that? If you're here with us this morning and you have never extended that open hand of faith to Christ, did you hear the good news? Did you hear that the triune God has worked before you even existed to ensure that there was a way of salvation available for you? You can receive the work of Christ with an open hand of faith. 
and he will deliver you from the darkness within and the darkness without. You will be delivered from this present evil age. And you can, in fact, put your faith in Christ where you're sitting right now. That is the good news of the gospel. But as you've seen from what we just read together, it is possible for Christian people to depart from the gospel. It's possible for Christian people to depart from the gospel. And one of the ways that that we think that that gospel departure is going to happen is through drift. And we've all heard illustrations about drift, and, and you drift further and further and further apart, and it happens gradually over time so that you look back and you realize, oh, I'm, I'm not in contact with the shore anymore. And it, and it is true. Uh, we, we can drift away from the gospel in a process that takes time. But it's also, also possible for us to, to move away from the gospel quite quickly, which is why the Apostle Paul says in these verses that we've, that we've just read together, he says, I'm astonished, basically I'm shocked, that you have so quickly deserted the gospel for another gospel, which actually isn't the gospel at all. And I want to illustrate for you what it looks like to to quickly depart from the gospel by showing you two videos that I've watched way too many times. Uh, I even watched them again this morning and was laughing, even though I knew what happens in the videos. Okay, But I want to show you... Now, two videos in a row that just give you an example of what it looks like to depart from the gospel. All right, that's us. <laughs> You're the sheep. <laughs> Woo, we've been saved. Right back in the ditch. <laughs> My favorite thing about that second video is that the, the sheep is so happy to be free and it like jumps like it's going to clear the ditch and is straight back in the ditch again. <laughs> okay, so... So we're not going to be too proud. We're not going to say, all right, that happened to the Galatian believers, but that's not the kind of thing that would happen to me. It is very possible for us to be immediately freed, so grateful for the grace of Jesus, and just to immediately run back into the ditch. And so this morning, I just want to give you a quick reminder. It's this truth. Don't let go the gospel. Don't let go of the gospel. We often think that evangelism is something that believers do for people who are not yet followers of Jesus. But the Bible would have us know that each one of us needs to be evangelized all the time. If you are a Christian, you need constant evangelism. Because we are constantly running back to the ditch and away from the gospel. There are two primary ways that we let go of the gospel that I want to highlight for you in the verses that we read this morning that I hope will be helpful to you as you're thinking about what to be on alert for as we consider this this directive from the text and not to let go of the gospel. Here's the first way the text tells us that we are often prone to let go of the gospel. Number one, we let go of the gospel when we desert the grace of Christ. We let go of the gospel when we desert the grace of Christ. Look again at verse 6. Paul says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly 
deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Now, there's a little book that I have in my office that's been very helpful to me called The Gospel-Centered Life. And some of the things that I'm going to say that follow are, are taken from that book. Um, and then I'll have a couple of diagrams that I want to show you that will be helpful to you. But when, when you first become a Christian, the cross seems really big, right? Uh, it, especially if you became a Christian later in life. Um, especially if you've come to, come to follow Jesus in adulthood. When you grasp what I just talked about a few moments ago, when you start to wrap your mind around, wait a minute, the triune God chose before the world was created that he was going to create a plan of redemption that, it's, that involved the giving of his son to rescue me. And I know everything I've done. I know everything I've thought. I know everything I've said. I know some of the dark places that I've been. I mean, when you real and, and then you realize, wait a minute, so what do I have to do to receive forgiveness of sins? And you realize the answer is not religion. You realize the answer is that open hand of faith. When you, when you start, when, when that picture comes together and you start to get it for the first time, the cross is amazing. You can hardly believe that God would send his son to die for you. You can hardly believe that you could just walk away and leave your burdens at the foot of the cross. That God doesn't require you to beat yourself up anymore. That he doesn't ask you to carry around your guilt. That he doesn't ask you to carry around your shame. That he has fully and finally dealt with it. He has freed you to walk in newness of life. That is an amazing thing, and the cross seems so big. And we end up growing. We start growing in our faith. God starts changing us from the inside out. But there's a couple of unexpected things that also start growing. As we move along in our Christian faith, we start having a growing awareness of two things. The first thing we start having a growing awareness is, uh, of is God's holiness. When you become a Christian, when you become a follower of Jesus, when you start exploring the Bible, as you start moving on from that, that first profession of faith in Jesus you start to realize how incredibly holy and set apart God is in the Bible. You start seeing all the things that he has, has done, and you start reading about people like Isaiah who, ha, who get to, to, to be, have a vision of being in the very throne room of God, and when, they walk in, when he's in the throne room of God, he's not sitting there saying, man, this is cool. I'm in God's throne room. He says, woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. Okay, what that is, is moving into the presence of God and realizing that, that God's holiness is far greater than we ever imagined. So that's one thing that's happening. There's another thing, growing awareness that's happening. Not only are we having a growing awareness of God's holiness, but we are also having a growing awareness of our own sinfulness. The cross loomed large. It was, it was big. You couldn't believe that God's grace was covering all of your sins. And then as you are excitedly beginning the, the, the journey of becoming a follower of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus, the assumption might be that where it's going to be like a rocket ship to the moon. I mean, I am going to be changing every day, and I'm going to be experiencing all these wonderful things. And some of that does happen. So a lot of times, for some of us, God forgives us of some particularly 
uh, uh, ingrained, besetting sins. There are ways that God changes us immediately, and we just expect that that's going to keep happening the whole way. And then you kind of hit the mud. And you realize that what God saved you from is a lot, more, a lot worse than you thought. That there are ingrained patterns of thinking and being and speaking and acting that are not so easy to uproot. And it could be frustrating because we look at our own assessment of, of where we are and each of us has a diagram in our mind of checking the progress, okay, I've been a Christian this many years, this is where I, where I should be, and we realize, oh, this is, I, I'm, I'm much worse than I thought. And I'm growing a lot slower than I thought. And I thought it would be easy to kick this habit, but it's not. And I'm even praying. So we have two things going on at the same time. A growing awareness of God's holiness and a growing awareness of our own sinfulness. And so what happens is this. I'll put the graphic up on the screen for you so you can see it. And I never actually looked at this ahead of time. So is that? Oh, it's big enough. Right? We can, most of us can see that. Uh, you can see that upward, that upward one is our growing awareness of God's holiness. The, the downward is our growing awareness of our own sinfulness. And look what can happen here. The cross stays the same size. So we, our appreciation of and our understanding of the cross doesn't grow along with us as we have an increased awareness of God's holiness and our own sinfulness. So now you can see above and below the cross as we move forward, there is a gap, right? There's gaps on either side. And now we're faced with a, now we're faced with, with a dilemma. How am I going to fill in those gaps? So we often try to fill in those gaps through either performing or pretending, let me tell you exactly kind of how those things work. If you look up in the growing awareness of God's uh, uh, holiness, we see the gap there. And rather than an increased trust in Christ and his cross, we say, uh-oh, there's a gap. I'll fill this in. And that's why we often have Christian, people who have been Christians a long time actually become more self-righteous and more proud and more legalistic, because without realizing it, they've seen there's a gap, and they thought, that gap can't be there, I need to fill it, and we often fill that gap with our own performing for God. The cross got us most of the way, and we're going to fill in the gap with the rest. Now, don't hear me wrong, there is, a, there is certainly, and you've, if you've been around for any length of time, you've heard me say this many times, uh, there's certainly a place for our own doing of good works. God has called us and saved us for a life of good works. But that, good, that life of good works that God has saved us to and for is not intended to fill that gap. Because if you use your good works to fill that gap, you have now embraced a gospel of Jesus plus. Jesus plus Whatever it is that I'm doing fills in that gap. Right. On the bottom side of it, there's the, gap of the, there's the gap between the cross and my growing awareness of my own sinfulness. And as I come to a growing awareness of my own sinfulness, what, what often happens? I beat myself up. I live a life of shame. I live a life of guilt. And it moves me away from God because I'm embarrassed to speak to God because in my mind, I should be here, but I'm here, and I'm a lot more sinful than I realize, and I'm not sure if God realized what he was getting into when he saved me. It's kind of like, you know, you watch uh, the shows on HGTV, and they, somebody buys a house, and they're going to they're gonna flip it, and they get into the house, and what happens on every show that has ever happened? They break some, they pull some wall out and they're like, oh, I didn't know this was here. Tell me the bad news. Well, it's going to be $10 million to redo everything in this house. 
And the people are like, ah, well, I guess we have to do it. Because they all, on the TV, they all have an extra $10 million to fix that. If I was on there, I'd be like, well, I, somebody else can have this house. I'd walk out. But no, they've got $10 million to do it. And it happens every time. And we sometimes feel like God kind of pulls the drywall back and is like, oh boy, <laughs> we got some foundation damage here. He knew the foundation damage was there. He knew the termites had eaten completely through this thing, that the house is going to have to be repiped and that it's not up to code. He knew all of this stuff. And yet we act like he didn't know that. He didn't know what he was getting into. And so we've got this, this guilt and this shame that we carry with us. And so to cover up that guilt and shame, we just pretend. And so we have a church full of people who are pretending that we're okay and we're pretending that we're not struggling and you look good and I, I look good, right? So let's just keep it that way. These are how we fill in the gaps. Now, Paul is going to discuss this later when he says in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 3, he says, are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? He's not saying, don't pursue a life of righteousness. What he is saying is if, if God did the work of salvation, if the gospel is the good news that I said it was at the beginning, do you think that, do, do you think that it's going to be effective to say, hey, God, thank you so much. I'll take it from here. Your salvation is God's work from start to finish. The one who began a good work in you says that he is going to complete that good work in you until the day of Jesus Christ. You're going to get there. And it's not because you're chipped in and helped out. It's going to be because God knew exactly what he was getting into from the very beginning and has the whole thing under control and has had the whole thing under control the whole time because he knew how bad you were and how holy he is and he still saved you. So, what then needs to happen is shown now by this graphic that I'll put up behind me. As we experience an increasing awareness of our own sinfulness and increasing knowledge of God's holiness, we need to also have a growing appreciation for the cross. The cross can't stay the same size in our minds, which is why we need to be evangelized all the time as Christians. We need to experience the gospel in new and fresh ways. We need, as we encounter the difficulties of life and our own frustrations and our guilt and our shame and our experience with self-righteousness and pride and legalism, all of those things need to be cleared away if the cross gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And I don't mean that the cross actually grows. I mean that our understanding of it grows. When we resort to a life of pretending or performing, we have believed the gospel of Jesus plus. Disney Plus, good. Jesus Plus, bad. There's only one thing we need. It's Jesus. And listen, if, if we resort to living a life of Jesus Plus, we've deserted the gospel. See, we think deserting the gospel is going to come through always through something like deconstruction or something like that, abandoning the faith entirely. And that does happen. But perhaps the greater danger is for you and I to desert the gospel by, by embracing the gospel of Jesus plus and never even realizing it. We're just filling in the gaps. 
and we were never meant to. All right, so don't let go of the gospel. We let go of the gospel of Christ when we desert the grace of Christ. And in the second place, we let go of the gospel of Christ when we distort the gospel of Christ. And I know I need to move quickly here, so I'm going to do this as quickly as I can. Paul says in verse 7 that there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. What is he talking about? I'm going to try to summarize it for you very quickly. If you were here with us last week, what we talked about last week will help you. But one of the things that was going on in in the Galatian church, which is a church in a region of Galatia, it was written to the it was like uh, written to the Galatians. One of the one of the conflicts and controversies that was going on in the church is that there was there was conflict between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. Jewish Christians had all the practices of the Old Testament law that they had been following for centuries and centuries, and and all of these. All of these, this way of living, which, which really regulated every aspect of their behavior from what they wore to where they went to what they did on particular days down to the very food that they ate. And what it basically did is it, it kept them separate or set apart from other people. But then Jesus comes and in Christ, all peoples are united. And so you have people coming together as the one people of God, and they're trying to figure out how to be together without offending the living daylights out of each other is really what it comes down to. And it was a difficult, it was a very difficult situation. And in fact, the Apostle Peter gets caught up in it so that he, um, he would eat with Gentile Christians, but then he would also eat with Jewish Christians that wouldn't allow the Gentile Christians at the table unless they followed the same sort of dietary restrictions. And so one of the funniest things in the Bible is that the Apostle Paul calls Peter out. In chapter 2, he says, I opposed Peter to his face. That, that, that must have been an epic battle. Two apostles. And Paul says, I opposed him to his face for he was not walking in truth with the gospel. He's not walking in line with the gospel. In other words, he was recognizing that, that, that what Peter was doing was the gospel of Jesus plus. See, what was happening is, is people were gathering together for meals, and what we're talking about here is probably the Lord's Supper. Okay, the Lord's Supper is like the unifying ritual that we have as Christians to affirm our oneness in Christ, despite all sorts of other things that may separate us. And yet, the very meal that was supposed to show God's unity is like, you are absolutely welcome to have a seat at the table as long as you've trusted Jesus and this list of things. And Paul says, that is a distortion of the gospel. And this is so easy to do. Because we all have our pet things. We all have our own experiences. We all have our, our ways of being and what it looks like to be a Christian. And, and sometimes we're, we turn our practices into principles. And instead of saying, this is how I believe I should follow God, we say, this is how I believe I should follow God, and you have to do it too. We let go of the gospel when we distort the gospel of Christ. When we add things to it to say, yes, we all believe in Jesus, and you'll be welcome with us as long as you also do all these things. Paul says this should not be so among God's people. I've got to end, but what I want you to notice is in both of these instances, whether it be deserting the grace of Christ or distorting the gospel of Christ, in either of these instances, there has been no conscious departing from the gospel. 
if you were to ask Peter and Paul and the Gentile Christians and the Jewish Christians what the gospel was, they'd all give you the same definition. But in practice, it would be different. We can be pretending and performing like crazy to fill in those gaps. But if you gave us a theological exam and asked us if we could define the gospel, we could all get it right. And that's why there's a warning for us not to let go of the gospel. Because this is the reality. It is very possible to abandon the gospel without ever rejecting. It is possible to abandon it without ever rejecting it. Everyone in this room needs the gospel this morning. How does the Spirit apply this to your heart right now? A good exercise for you to do this afternoon would be be to ask yourself the question, where is my gospel, the gospel of Jesus plus? Where, yup, Jesus, and I'll also feel good about myself if I do these things. And then we need to repent of believing a false gospel, a different gospel which is not the gospel at all, but a completely separate gospel that does not save. For the last 10 years, I think that the message that I want us to get is that just Jesus is enough. And when you get that, you don't have to live in guilt. You don't have to live in shame. You don't have to run on the treadmill of performance. And it frees you to be gracious with each other. Okay, so you may be doing better here. And that we we tend to make ourselves the standard. Well, I've made it here. But we're not all starting from the same point. (laughs) If the center is where we're headed, we're all over that circle, traveling in all kinds of different directions to get there. We don't know the work that God is doing in each other's lives or where they've been or what they've been through or what the Spirit is doing. And so we expect that sometimes we're going to be lousy to each other. And and sometimes we're going to do things that are horrifying. But a, a group of people that are centered around the gospel is able to handle that with each other. I'm able to see the darkness in you, because I know the darkness in me. And I don't have to pretend it's not that way. Because Jesus is enough. And the only way we're going to be able to continue moving forward as a church for the next decade is if you and I are absolutely committed to the reality that Jesus is enough. So let's ask God, to help us believe the good news. Lord, we've heard a sobering word in some respects this morning because we're reminded that it is possible for us to very quickly depart from the gospel, abandon it without ever rejecting it, and in fact thinking we are embracing it. And so pray that you would check us this morning. That you would help us to examine our own hearts. To make sure that we are holding fast to the good news of Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for the good news of Jesus. We thank you that everything that needs to be done for our salvation has been accomplished. And that in that freedom, we can pursue righteous lives, not to gain your favor, not to keep your favor, but because we have it in a way that can't be lost. If there is someone here this morning who has not believed the good news, would you give them 
as a gift, the open hand of faith to receive it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Men, would you stand as we respond to what we've heard?
I can't say it any better, but I think I needed to hear it one more time. So might I encourage you guys this week, as you go into the sanctuary, as you leave the sanctuary, as you go out to your cars, do not, do not let go of the gospel. <laughs> On Monday morning, when your feet hit the floor, do not let go of the gospel. May we, as a church, have a growing understanding of the cross that overflows into the life around us, so that what we do with our time and with our money is the result of us understanding the gospel better and going forward and living in the truth of a God that loves us more than we can ever know or understand. I have two quick announcements. The first one uh, is just to reiterate that we have a mission briefing on April 21st. That will be for everyone who is a member uh, and if anyone is curious, uh, just please let us know if you'd like to come. But on April 21st at 6 p.m., we'd like to ask at least one member of every family who's a member here to show up. We are doing this for the first time in a little while. We're going to knock off some rust and talk about some critical business that we're doing as a church, how we are growing with the gospel and how we're going with the gospel. Uh, the second one, uh, I will selfishly make a youth group announcement. Uh, <laughs> so for those parents who have not signed up yet, you have three days to sign up for summer camp this summer. Uh, but this does apply to the whole congregation because as soon as those signups are done, we're going to be hitting you guys hard and fast with some fundraising efforts. So please uh, open up your time and your hearts to the youth group as we prepare uh, to do something awesome this summer. Hang out, spend five straight days uh, living in the truth of the gospel and growing uh, in community with local churches. I only prepared one benediction, uh, and I did not mean to copy Matt. <laughs> but if you will, join me in Romans 11. Uh, I don't have another another benediction, so please, I will reiterate. Uh, I think, yeah, I mean, how can we not do it? So join me in Romans 11. Please receive the benediction. Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable are his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen.